Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. In Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I identify as an alcoholic and probably an addict. Because that's in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's the way we like it done. See, because in Alcoholics Anonymous, we relate one alcoholic to another alcoholic, see? And that's just what's always worked and what's working today and what I have absolute belief will work tomorrow. Now, when I, re- when I relate and uh, speak in uh, Cocaine Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, I identify there as an addict and probably an alcoholic, because that's the way they like it done, you see, and, and, and it doesn't worry me today, see. I'm Mickey Bush, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. This is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, isn't it? <laughs> now, wait a minute, is this an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting? <laughs> right, all right. So now I know who I am, what I am, and where I ought to be, you see. That's Mickey Bush, the best bush in town. <laughs> I just spoke in Washington DC, you know, and and I said that there and a lot of people agreed. <laughs> anyway, uh Mickey Bush. Mickey Bush, that puts me somewhere between a mouse and a president. At any given time, that's where I'm likely to be, you know. <laughs> Golly, I'm really happy to be here. I drove up from Los Angeles today, and uh, and it was a tiring drive, but I got a nice new Jaguar car, so it was comfortable. And uh, you know, I I, I stayed. I normally when I, I do lots of conferences, and 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 I always try and get there for the full three days and and uh, participate in the conference. I love participating in Alcoholics Anonymous, and. Uh, this weekend was a little bit of an exception, and um, and I'm glad that you guys are reasonably local to me because um, last night I gave a guy a 10-year cake, a guy I um, 12 stepped into the program, and last night he took a 10-year birthday cake, and I gave it to him, and uh, you know that was a real privilege, and that was worth staying down and putting the extra effort into coming up here today. You know, 10 years. And, and congratulations, Sharon. Shannon, was it? Um, that, uh, that took her 10 years today. And congratulations to, I've been to many conferences. There's as much sober time here as anywhere else I've ever been, man. This is great. I'm really like thrilled to be here. Yeah. Can I see the hands of the newly sober people, the newcomers again? Let's see the hands. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. How about those folk who just feel new? Those, you know, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> Some days I, I feel so new. I get out, you know, I wake up and the disease is sitting on the edge of the bed says, I'm glad you're awake, I've been waiting to talk to you. <laughs> now I'm an alcoholic, I'm a total alcoholic. Everything that's about me is alcoholic, you see. But you know what? I always drank alcohol, but I didn't only drink alcohol. I always drank it, but I didn't only drink it. See? So if there's 12 steps attached to a program, I'm a contender for it, man. If there's a program with 12 steps attached to it, I'm a contender for it. So, you know, sure, I love being in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I go to lots of other 12-step programs too. And I've got multiple addictions and multiple stuff. You are not looking at a well man up here, you know. And we are not going to be talking cured, believe me, you know. I don't care if it's A-A-N-A-C-A, A-C-A, overeaters, little Peters. It don't matter what it is, man. I tell you, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a contender for it all. It don't matter what it is, man. <laughs> if there's 12 steps attached to it, I'm a contender for it. That's all there is to it. Well... Well, I, I, I got to back up, I guess, because Steve's here tonight. And Steve, did he do, did he do a good talk last night, Steve? Yeah. 
please remember my morning meeting and uh, our home group, so I better be honest up here and uh, and back up. I, I I did go to one of them little Peter meetings, but they wouldn't let me in. You know, <laughs> said I didn't qualify. What you black folk think you got a monopoly on this or what? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't qualify for Alateen either. I feel like a teenager most of the time, but I never get one. Uh, where's me? Yeah. <laughs> God damn, it's good to be here, man. Good to be here. How many weirdos are in the room tonight? How many people... A weird, see? I want to welcome you all to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to welcome the newcomers and tell you, keep coming back. Keep coming back. We love you. Keep coming back. That's what you guys told me on January the 15th, 1983, when I went to my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, we love you. Keep coming back. Never knew a damn thing about love. Never knew how to even receive it or... Acknowledge it, nothing. See? And I want to tell you, keep coming back for a couple of reasons. One is, go to lots and lots of meetings. For, for, for one thing, for example, if you're weird like I am, you, uh, you may be hearing things that I'm not saying. <laughs> what you're hearing may not be what I'm saying if you're weird like me. See, because I have a problem... Or, you know, I hear things weird. I receive stuff weird. Weird. Just always been weird. Never been anything else but weird. Being weird, I felt weird, I thought weird, I looked weird. People told me I was weird. People called me weird. Said you're weird. You know, always goddamn weird. Just weird. Weird and out of place. It's what I felt like. That's what I was thought of. You know, just weird. Weird and out of place. Felt like a goddamn turd on a wedding cake. You know what I mean? Just weird and out of place, you know? So keep coming back, because, you know, what you're hearing may not be what I'm saying, see? You know? So come back and visit us. <laughs> I've always been weird, you know? It never happened just when I got to AA. Years before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, people calling me weird. My you know, mum thought I was weird. And I used to hear things differently, differently to normal people. For example, I, would, uh, I was born in, in London, England. I'm from northwest London. You can probably tell that, can you? you know, alcohol didn't do this to me. This is the way I talk. You know what I mean? <laughs> My mum still lives in northwest London. She's... She's still there. She's 80 years of age next month. Still lives there. And the house I grew up in was um, a house that had steps going up to the uh, bedrooms. And uh, and just as a young dude, man, I would come home and I would be shit-faced, you know, just ripped, you know, and just just a mess. Ever since I was big enough or ugly enough to do what I wanted to do. And I would, my mum used to sleep in the bedroom at the top of the stairs and, and she always had the door open, you know, and uh, probably one eye open too. I mean, mums are weird like that, don't they? They sleep with one eye. And it's weird how mums always know what you've been up to, you know. And uh, I would come home and I would like be drunk and I would stagger up the steps and, and fall over and just be ripped and, 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 and my mum would call out from the bedroom, drunk again, son. And I'd say, so am I, Mum. <laughs> She'd say, I'm not drunk. I've been in bed since eight o'clock. What's wrong with you? You know. And people always said, what's wrong with you? Anybody here ever been asked what's wrong with them? No shit. Yeah, what's wrong with you? Because I, I would hear things weird, see? I wouldn't hear it the way it was said. And I was always getting in trouble and what have you. And that wasn't just because I was you know, getting sober. I can fast forward to when I was getting sober. I got sober, I went to my first meeting on January the 15th, 1983. West Hollywood. Weird place. And, uh, of course, eventually, I 
I had to do things that you told me to do. I had to get a job. She'd go to work. I went, what? She'd go to work. Get a job. I said, what? <laughs> She'd get a job. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> so I eventually got a job. I had to get a bus. I don't know nothing about getting a job and getting buses. I don't know from getting buses. I ain't never got a bus. But I see the buses full up every day. I figure it must be easy enough to get a bus. I get on a bus, standing up on this bus, and it took off, and I fell forward. I fell right against this chick, fell right on her boobs, as a matter of fact. She went, move your hands. I went, sure. <laughs> squeeze, squeeze. Because <laughs> I don't hear shit right, see? I hear things weird. <laughs> Got me in all kinds of trouble, see? So keep coming back. Here's some other shit. Yeah. Anyway, I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I do believe it was God doing for me what I couldn't do myself. My best friend had just axed me out of his life. said, get the hell out of my life. I ain't going to be around you when you're drinking anymore. Holy shit. Well, this dude had been 12-stepping me. I didn't know about 12-stepping. I hear a lot of stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, like what, what I call lip-flapping party-line bullshit. See? <laughs> One of those things is your best thinking got you here. Well, I can promise you my best thinking never got me here. I can promise you I never came out of no two-day blackout and with my best thinking said, Mick, your life is a mess. You better go to AA and sort the bugger out. <laughs> it never happened. My best thinking never got me here. One of you chaps who've been 12-stepping my sick ass got me here. And I believe it was through the grace of God. I never knew he was 12-stepping me. I never knew nothing about Alcoholics Anonymous. I never knew nothing about being an alcoholic. I never knew nothing about nothing. As I thought I did. As I thought I was some kind of hip-happening dude, you know, I was actually broke, busted, disgusted, and not to be trusted. I was wrecked on every level. Couldn't even afford to pay attention. You know? And a guy had been 12-stepping me, an English rock and roll singer, and he was two and a half years sober. And he'd been planting the seed. And I never knew nothing like that. But they say when the master's, when the pupil's ready, the master appears. And I came out of a two-day blackout not knowing where I'd been or what I'd been doing, just like this beautiful book describes, pitiful and incomprehensibly demoralized. Pay, P-A-I-D. Anybody read this book, by the way? It's a good idea. <laughs> mm. Never knew nothing about nothing. And my best friend who was visiting from Spain, I called him up. I'd just come out of a two-day blackout. Any other blackout drinkers here? And the rest of you lying mothers. God damn, man, I can tell blackout drinkers when I see them. God. It's Tuesday morning and I went out drinking Sunday lunchtime and I don't know where I've been and what I've been doing, but I know it ain't okay. Because if you come out of blackouts like me, you know them, them things. Now, I told you I'm an alcoholic. I'm a total alcoholic. I always drank alcohol, but I didn't only drink alcohol. I also do loads of other things. Loads and loads and loads of other things. I always drank, but I didn't only drink. I did loads of other things like drugs. Mountains of drugs. Now, I don't know what kind of an alcoholic you are, but I'm the kind of alcoholic that did mountains of drugs. <laughs> now, if there's any alcoholics in the room tonight that are like um, specialists, I want you to know that I'm a chemical gourmet, man. I took mountains of drugs. Now, I don't want to offend any real alcoholics in here tonight. So I want to assure you that I did all my drugs alcoholically. Okay? <laughs> God damn. 
I never even heard the term drug of choice till I came here. What the bloody hell's a, a drug of choice, for Christ's sake? I don't know from drug of choice. I have no idea what a drug of choice is. I can't even imagine anybody coming... I can't imagine anybody coming up to me backstage at a Rolling Stones concert and saying, Hey, dude, what's your drug of choice? <laughs> what? Nobody ever said that to me out there. I never even heard that till I came here, drug of choice. Mick, backstage, bring a rig with you. Backstage, plenty of good shit. Certainly not my drug of choice is Jack Daniels, for Christ's sake. <laughs> it never happened. It never happened. Drug of choice. Do you know, if I got a drug of choice, you know what it is? Yours. <laughs> Whatever you got. <laughs> Whatever you got is my drug of choice. And anything you got is my favourite. It don't matter what it is, for Christ's sake. I don't know from drug of choice. I never... Oh, drug of... I can't imagine what a drug of choice is. See, anything, anything, anything that would affect me up here and get me out of up here. I can remember one day being on the phone to the connection in the street trying to get something for nothing. Anybody been there? <laughs> and, and in the street, I looked down and there's a pill on the floor. I went, oh, look at that. Wow. Swooped on this pill. Picked it up and ate it. Didn't know what the hell it was. It didn't matter what it was. It was a pill. Could have been a bloody dog worming pill for all I know. It was a goddamn pill. It might have done something. Drug of choice? I don't know from drug of choices. I've no idea what a drug of moderation. What the bloody hell's moderation? I don't know from moderation. I never did a damn thing in my entire life in moderation. Nothing. Except the steps. So the steps was the only thing I ever did in moder moderation. For Christ's sake. I don't know from moderation. I don't know none of that. I don't know none of that. And I and my disease is more, 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 more. I just want more of everything, don't matter what it is. Just want more of it. Don't even know what the bloody hell I'm going to say up here tonight, but I do know I want more time to say it in. <laughs> God damn, man, more of everything. If there was nothing else to do in the whole wide world but breathe the air... I would go, because <laughs> I'd want more air than you, <laughs> or I'd want your air. Just a pig, see? Just a goddamn pig. And I always drank, always, 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 always drank. I never remember not drinking, for Christ's sake. And I guess I drank the same as you, same as I can see some of you did anyway until I was full up or as near to being full up as I could get at any given time. In fact, if I never had skin, I'd have just formed a puddle, for Christ's sake. Just leaking everywhere, for Christ's sake. Just a pig, just drinking all the time. In London, England, that was it. That's what we did in the pubs. Thought I was a social drinker. Any other social drinkers here? Lying load of mothers, yeah. This is a disease of denial, folks, I'm telling you that. We'll see how deep that denial looks. Just a couple of hands went up. I'll tell you why I was a social drinker. Because every time anybody said, I'm going for a drink, I said, so shall I. <laughs> how many social drinkers now? Oh, denial. Well, I come out of this two-day blackout, don't know where I've been. I go out Sunday lunchtime, now it's Tuesday morning, I don't know where I've been. I call up my best pal, he pisses off. Get the hell away from me. He said, don't even talk to me again. He said, you pain in the arse. And I call up this other dude. This other dude's been lurking around. I call him up and he's laughing at me. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, you. I said, why? He said, because you do weird shit, that's why. I said, what do you mean? And he laughed. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, I ain't had a drink for two and a half years. I said, why is that? Because I never knew he didn't have a drink for two and a half years. 
I mean, why would I? I never took any notice of no one else. Just me. Just thinking about me all the time. Just like the beautiful book says, self-obsessed, egocentric, selfish, self-centered, self-seeking. Just thinking about me all the time. Don't take no notice of no one else. I may not be very much, but I'm all I think about. So. <laughs> He said, you ain't drank nothing for two and a half years. Why is that? He said, because I used to drink like you. He said, what do you mean? And he let out a hoot like you never heard. I said, don't keep laughing at me for Christ's sake. I'm a delicate dude. I've got all these feelings. He said, you don't remember what you got up to over the weekend, do you? I said, no. And he laughed. He said, why do you keep laughing at What happened? He said, well, it all started after you peed in that lady's dinner. I said, what? He said, your friend took us all to that smart Beverly Hills restaurant. In the middle of the restaurant, you got all ticked off at some old lady and got up and whacked it out and did it right in her spaghetti. I said, oh, my God. And the first thought that came to my mind was, how the hell can I wriggle out of this? He said, I'll have to speak to you later. Well, on the table, on my coffee table, and I didn't know where it came from, I do, I found out later, there was a copy of this book and a meeting guide. Now, I was living in, above Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. Now, West Hollywood's a very weird place. I fitted right in. And, and, and there was a meeting directory there, and, and it was uh, open at a page, and I flipped through it, and there was a meeting, an AA meeting, just down the road on San Vicente Hill called Architects of Adversity. And I could walk there, because my car didn't run. I, uh, I had a little red sports car, but it hadn't run for three months and wasn't likely to either, part of the unmanageability. And, and I walked down to this meeting in West Hollywood. Now, I don't know whether you know West Hollywood or not, but uh, it's very weird. Some people call it Boys Town. Just a weird place to be, that's all. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the kind of town where if you drop your wallet on Santa Monica Boulevard, you've got to kick it up to sunset before you can pick it up. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just a place I was living, nothing to do with nothing, you know. I walk down to this meeting. There's two dudes standing outside this meeting. One of them stuck his hand out to me. Now, today, I know they're greeters. I didn't know then. Stuck his hand out. What do you want? <laughs> he said, welcome to AA. I said, what? He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, what? The other dude said, keep coming back. I said, what? I said, keep coming back. I said, what for? He said, we love you. I said, I bet you do. <laughs> I don't know nothing about nothing, and anything I don't know nothing about, I'll get scared of or attack. Walked into that meeting, walked into that meeting, that Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Holy shit. Walked into that meeting with, oh, wow. Holy shit. Fitted right in. Bunch of weirdos in there. I fit it right in. I didn't feel like a goddamn turd on a wedding cake anymore. Just went straight in. The guy leading the meeting was an English rock and roll singer I'd known for years, and he was mental. He was completely insane. I said, what the hell are you doing here? You're mental, you are. You ought to be locked up, you did. He said, I'm 22 months sober. Welcome to AA. I went, holy shit. First thing I thought, well, they keep telling me I'm nuts. Maybe I can get sober too. Holy shit. Holy shit. There were some other people I knew there as well. I went, wow, I didn't know. Were you? Oh, fuck. Oh, wow. <laughs> Golly. Went into that meeting and went, wow, holy shit. Guy there had done something for me that had never, ever happened before. Guy told me I was alcoholic. He said, you're alcoholic. I said, what? He said, you're alcoholic. I said, what? Stuck his finger in my chest. said, you're alcoholic. I said, what do you mean? He said, that story you just told me was explaining a blackout. I said, no, no, no. I wasn't in no blackout. 
I didn't know what it was, but denied it anyway, just in case. See? Because I deny everything. I didn't know then that it's a disease of denial like I do now. I deny everything. It was a man telling me he was in a blackout. I didn't even know what it is, but I deny it anyway. I said, no, I wasn't in no blackout. I was awake. I was doing shit. He said, I said, blackout, idiot, not pass out. I went, oh, I didn't know you did shit in a blackout. Like travel and other things. <laughs> Yeah, he said, we call that a blackout. I went, oh, shit, alcoholic, alcoholic, holy shit, alcoholic, wow, alcoholic, far out, alcoholic, holy shit, I'm alcoholic, wow, that's great, alcoholic, that was like a step up for me. They'd been locking me up in nut wards all my life. I wasn't al I wasn't nuts. I was alcoholic. When holy shit, alcoholic! I'm gonna put that down on a resume, man. <laughs> alcoholic for Christ's sake. Alcohol. That was I mean, alcoholic. I went well far out. Alcoholic. Holy shit! I like that. I went home and told my pal, I said, hey, guess what? I'm alcoholic. I'm powerless over alcohol. My life's unmanageable. He said, no shit. Everybody else knew except me. When I admitted I was alcoholic, all that actually did was make it unanimous. <laughs> Everybody else already knew. The man telling me I'm alcoholic. Holy shit. God damn. That was great, alcoholic. No one had ever told me that. They kept locking me up. They kept dragging me off and incarcerating me in nut wards and shit. But they never once came and dragged me off and said, we're going to lock you up for repeating the same behaviour and expecting a different result. <laughs> Not once. You guys told me. They never once told me I was alcoholic. They incarcerated me. They'd done all the stuff, but nothing ever happened. Well, like what happened to that very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? See, it worked for this alcoholic. The magic that works in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous worked for me. Like nothing else had ever done. Nothing else had ever done. Nothing else they'd ever done to me ever worked. Like the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous on that very first day. They'd locked me up in padded cells. They'd incarcerated me. They'd chained me down. They'd shot me up with all kinds of tranquilizers, And they'd zapped me with machines and Christ knows what else and electrolysis. Never done a damn thing for me. Couldn't get me to do what they wanted me to do. They'd beat the shit out of me. We had that thing down there in, Long in uh, Los Angeles a while back, the Rodney King thing. That wasn't a black thing. Those cops don't give a shit what colour you are when they're beating the crap out of you. I've been in Rodney King's position loads of times. The man beat me with a stick once. He went, crack, and I put my arm up like that, broke my arm. With the other hand, I went, screw you! Could not get me to do what they wanted me to do. This disease snapped its fingers and wheeled me in like a fish. <coughs> I was powerless over it. I had no idea about it either. I had no idea that I was powerless over a disease called alcoholism. Didn't even know I had it. Here was a man who told me I was alcoholic. He didn't care about how I felt. He didn't give a shit what I thought or whether I understood it. He didn't worry about my feelings. Told me I was alcoholic. Our beautiful book, don't say we don't tell people they're alcoholic. It says we prefer not to, which is a totally different thing. This dude told me you're alcoholic. And I do the same thing too. Every single day I stand on the firing line. I've got three recovery houses, halfway houses in San Fernando Valley. And, and every single day I stand on the firing line and uh, see this disease killing God's kids that don't even know the, the nature of the beast. I tell them straight up. I tell them the same as you told me. I tell them. Steve, I tell you, I've got a reputation for being like delicate. <laughs> Tell them you're alcoholic, like you guys told me. I got on the same theory you guys told me. If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and sounds like a duck and smells like a duck, it's a goddamn duck. 
Just because it's been taking some shit and thinks it's an eagle, no, you're a duck. You're a goddamn duck. You're a duck, I'm a duck. Quack, quack. <laughs> and I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Now, some people are more delicate than me, but that's what worked for me. I've been really glad as well. Now, I told you I was alcoholic. I am a total alcoholic, just like this beautiful book says. I'm an alcoholic of our kind. Alcoholic of our kind. Now, I don't know what kind of alcoholic you are, but I'm an alcoholic of our kind. And this is what worked for me, Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know whether anything else would have worked for me or not, because I never tried nothing else. I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's worked ever since. And I have not had another drink past my lips from that very first day. I don't know whether anything else would have worked. I don't know. I don't know whether I could have done it on my own or not. I never tried. I do know I tried to do other things on my own and I couldn't do it. But even if I could have done it on my own, who the bloody hell wants to? I've been years alone up here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've been, I've been backstage at, at, at Led Zeppelin concerts, you know. 50,000 fans in the arena and I'm backstage lonely. Full of guilt, shame, remorse, anxiety, fear, worry, loneliness, apart from the separateness. That curtain reminds me of a story too. <laughs> I was backstage at a Rolling Stones concert once. Lonely. 50,000 fans, probably more. Everybody's having a great time. I'm backstage. Everything you can possibly want in the world is back there. Money, property, prestige, groupies, drugs, everything you could possibly want is backstage and I'm backstage lonely. That particular night, there was a backdrop like this backstage and it hadn't been crossed off, it hadn't been closed up properly. And there was a three inch gap in the curtain. Now I'm backstage, Mick and the boys are all doing the stuff, the best rock and roll gig in the world, man. This, the stadium's full up. It's electrifying. 50,000 fans having a great time. I'm backstage, and as I walk past the three-inch gap in the curtain, in my head, 50,000 fans stop watching Mick Jagger and watch me walk past the three-inch gap. It's called self-obsession, my friend. You relate, huh? Now, I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't drink from day one. Still haven't took a, a drink. But I told you I do lots of other things too, and I was doing them. Never drank. Alcohol, Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous. Never drank from that day to this. But I carried on doing all the other shit, because I don't hear things right. I hear shit weird. And I never heard that it was all mind-altering chemicals. I just heard alcohol. So I never drank no more alcohol but I carried on doing all the other shit. Now, the dude who 12-stepped me, he'd been out on the road on a tour, and six weeks later, he comes into town. He comes to that first meeting that I went to. He walked into that meeting, he took one look at me, he went, Mick, what the hell happened to you? I said, what do you mean? He said, I used to call up every day. Folk used to tell me you were going to meetings doing good. I love a little codependent. But, I said, I'm doing great. He said, what? You're off the wall. I said, what do you mean I'm off the wall? He said, you're whacked, you are. I said, what do you mean I'm whacked? He said, what are you on? I said, nothing. He said, you can't be like that on nothing. <laughs> what did you do since you got up this morning? I said, the same as I do every morning. What, he said. I said, I woke up and I smoked a joint. He said, what? I said, I always light up a joint before I get up. Anybody here smoke a little pot? Anybody smoke a lot? He said, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean I can't do that? He said, it's a mind-altering chemical. I said, no, it ain't, it's pot. <laughs> he said, what a dick. Keep coming back, for Christ's sake, he said. He said, screw you, it don't mean pot, it's alcohol. 
I ain't got a problem with pot, for Christ's sake. Pot only does two things to me. It makes me horny and makes me hungry. No big deal. Except some mornings you wake up with a sore arm and a bed full of pizza crust. But apart from that... <laughs> Oh, you do that sick shit up here in Monterey, huh? <laughs> well, for you new folk, I want you to know I've changed. Twelve and a half years later, I've changed. I don't eat pizza in bed anymore. <laughs> so I'm still doing it. I do lots of other things, too. I like speed, crystal crank. Anybody here do a little speed, crystal crank? No shit. Anybody do a lot? No shit. Did he make your dick disappear too? <laughs> oh yeah. Try getting a doctor to explain that one. Oh, I could fire up a bunch of speed and go out and talk, 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 grind my teeth up to the Talk to you lovely ladies. Might as well have said to you lovely ladies, do you want to come home and we'll talk about sex? There's no chance of getting any. Oh, disappearing dick here. <laughs> I used to do that shit too, but I wasn't drinking. I used to like cocaine too. Anybody here do a little cocaine? Anybody do a lot? No shit. Do anything for cocaine, me. Except pay for it. Didn't like paying for it. <laughs> Didn't like paying for it. Didn't like that shit, no. I used to like hallucinogenics, MDA, LSD, dust. Love all that shit. Takes a lot longer than one day at a time to get over that, I'll tell you. <laughs> I still have bloody flashbacks now. Woo, gone. You still like heroin? Love heroin. Love dope, man. Love dope. I don't give a shit if I puke on you. If you want to fight, that's a bonus. I can't be doing with that. I'm a puker, for Christ's sake. Any other pukers here? No shit. I ain't no dribble-ass puker, neither. <laughs> I'm a goddamn directional puke of me. Could it's your foot from here. What? Why that? Goddamn. Puked all over Roger Daltrey once, just before he was going on stage. Just standing at the bar. Very dodgy man to stand next to at a bar. Standing at a bar, all of a sudden. Bleh. Shit. Puked on people all the time. <laughs> I wasn't drinking. See, I never knew, man. I just didn't hear that it was all mind or in chemicals. Weird, see? Now, I tell you what, you guys didn't tell me to get out, go somewhere else. You said, keep coming back. We love you. And you must have known I was whacked. Because I know when you guys are, so you guys must have known when I was here. And if you're an alcoholic and doing other things, don't get shuttled out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't get turned away. And if you're one of those people that are just an alcoholic and don't understand drugs, don't tell some poor little bugger who's doing dope who's an alcoholic to get out of out and go somewhere else. If you've got to, direct them to somebody like me who knows what the hell they're talking about. That was an alcoholic that also did lots of drugs. <laughs> but you know what? took me a long time and I kept coming, coming back and, 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 and it rubbed off, man. I started getting an inkling of the power greater than myself that you were talking about in a second step. See, I was powerless over alcohol because it made me do shit that I didn't want to do, including drinking it. Not what I did after I drank it. That was alcoholic addictive behaviour. But before I drank it, when I absolutely didn't want to drink it, when every fibre of my body screamed out against drinking it, when every desire I had in the world was to not drink it, I ended up drinking it anyway. Who's done that? No shit. Powerless over alcohol. Powerless over alcohol. And if you think you've done a first step by admitting you're alcoholic, you're missing the deal. Nowhere in this book, or the 12 and 12, does that come into it. No. First step is powerless over alcohol, which is a totally different thing. <clears throat> in fact, on page 20 of this book, it says, if you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do now? Well, if you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, we've got to do a spiritual 12-step program of recovery, starting with the first step. So admitting you're alcoholic is not the first step, and so many people think it is. 
powerless over alcohol. Why? Because it makes me do shit that I don't want to do, including drinking it. Sets me up to drink it long before I drink it. And if you're standing outside a liquor store or a crack house, you better have more going for you than the fact that you don't want to do it. <laughs> lip flappers say that shit. I hear lip flappers in AA say, I choose not to drink today. Well, piss on you. I choose not to. If I could rely on choosing, I wouldn't need to come here. I can, I can choose not to do it, but it don't mean shit. I did it three times in one day once. Can't rely on a choice. In fact, the book says I've lost the power of choice in alcohol. I can't just choose not to drink and rely on that. I don't even know where that shit comes from, man. Choose not to drink today. Just say no. Where the hell does that shit come from? Don't even know it. Nancy Rat Well, screw her too. Nancy bloody Rat. Just say no. Just say no to a dude like me. It's like telling a homeless dude. Hey, homeless dude, just get a house. If I could get a house, I wouldn't be homeless. No, and if I could just say no, I wouldn't be an alcoholic addict, neither. Just say no. I choose not to drink today. I don't know where that lip flapping shit. Don't drink and use no matter what. Where the hell does that shit come from? When we tell an alcoholic a new dude to not drink and use no matter what, we're telling him to do something it's impossible for an alcoholic to do. An alcoholic can't not drink and use no matter what. He will drink and use no matter what. I can't just tell him to go out possible for him to do. It's a crazy idea. I don't even know where that shit comes from. I, you know, because he goes out there, and maybe you like me, you go out there and then, I can't not drink and use no matter what, and you guys in here are telling me to do that, so I think that it don't work for me, because they're doing it and I can't. I gotta say to you, hey, we don't drink and use no matter what, and this is how we do it. Allow me to help you. Allow me to work my program by being of love and service to you. This is what we do. This is how we do it. Come here. Let me guide you and show you. You can't just do that shit on your own. That's why we all gotta help each other. We all gotta help each other in this pro program. We can't just do it on our, st on our own. Those folk out there, they don't know what the hell we're talking about. My own mum don't know what I'm talking about. My own mum loves me dearly. She don't know what the shit's going on with me. Never has done. I was just back in England. I walked into my mum's house and said, Mum, I'm 12 years sober. She said, so is the cat. <laughs> she don't give me a pat on the back for not doing something I shouldn't have done anyway. And she didn't think it was funny when I did weird shit. Like, like my favourite page of the book right now, page 132. Anybody read this book? It's good. 132 is good. Look, right at the bottom of the page, look. So we think cheerfulness and laughter make for usefulness. Outsiders are sometimes shocked when we burst into merriment over a seemingly tragic experience out of the past. But why shouldn't we laugh? We have recovered and been given the power to help others. What a gift. We have recovered and been given the power to help others. <laughs> My mum don't... <laughs> she don't burst into merriment when I've come home and like puke on the cat. She didn't think that was funny. Have you ever puked on a cat? Goddamn weird, I tell you. Weird. You come home and like you're just shit faced, right? And you're just you're just wrecked. And and you can feel it. You can feel it coming from down here. And it just comes comes up and it <laughs> And you look at it like like that. Right on the cat. You go, holy shit. I don't remember reading that. Goddamn cat gets up and runs off. 
Look at it. Look, whoa, look at that weird shit. Look, something else weird. You know, if you're a puker like I am, weird shit, man. I, I mean, I can promise you, I never once ate a diced carrot in my entire life. Not once. Yeah, every time I puke, there the bastards was. Diced carrot. Where does that diced carrot come from, for Christ's sake? Weird shit, man. My mum didn't think that was funny. She didn't burst into merriment over that shit. You sick buggers do, though. That's why we got to help each other, man. That's what this is all about. That's what these conferences are all about. That's what these meetings are all about. That's what the book's all about. That's what all the stuff is all about. One alcoholic relating to another alcoholic. Why? Because the second step took me that time to find out the power greater than myself was right here, right here in these rooms. Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. You guys describe the insanity as being repeating the same behaviour and expecting a different result. No one else had ever said that to me. You guys said that to me. So if I want to be restored to sanity, I've got to be somewhere else other than sane. Insane. I'm from London, England. If I want to return to London, I've got to be somewhere else other than London. I can't restore or return to London if I'm already there. So if I want to be restored to sanity, I've got to be somewhere else other than sane. You guys told me, keep repeating the same behaviour, expecting a different result was insane. That's what we considered it to be. In this book, we described it as that. Well, wow. So a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Well, right here, the very first meeting I went to, there was a man who was insane leading the meeting. So it could work for me. It worked for insane. There was a guy there with three days. There was a girl there with four months. There was a guy there with 30 years. I could see it work. I could see it, touch it, be a part of it. You guys said, keep coming back. We love you. I, I didn't have to like go on no big strong belief or nothing. It was right there. Here was the power greater than myself. You plus me was a power greater than me. Me plus you was a power greater than me on my own. You plus us was a power greater than you. Right here was that power. Now, I don't know why people have a problem with that because it says a power greater than myself. It don't say God. It don't say higher power. It don't say Jesus. It don't say Buddha. It don't say nothing else. It says a power greater than myself. There it was. Here it was. When one alcoholic comes together with another alcoholic, God comes between us and produces a power greater than either of us. Right here was a power greater than myself that I could see, touch, be a part of and welcomed into. It was right here. I could rely on it. I could see it happening. I could see people. We stood it tonight, didn't we? We had a countdown, proof that it works. So I turned my will and my life over to it. I didn't have a problem calling it God because... God was the name of the power. Now, Bill don't call it God in the second step. He calls it God in the third step. But that's the name he put on the power. Now, I don't have a, na- I don't have a problem putting God as the name of the power because G-O-D to me was group of drunks or group of drug addicts. That was great to me. I didn't care. We were in a group. G-R-O, grow, U-P, up. I could grow up in a group with God as the leader and the power and the name for the power. So if you put... God is the name of the power. Don't complain to me about God. Call it something else. The power is what we've got to rely on, not the name you call it. Call it bloody Mishiganovich if you want. I don't give a shit. See? But I could turn my will and my life over to it because I didn't care about it being a group of drunks. Go on dreaming. Get out, devil. Because that's what I felt I had in me, a devil. I didn't feel spiritual when I came here. I was definitely no bloody vision for you, you know, and, and, and I, felt, I felt like I had a devil inside me. This devil was in me, and I was puking all the time, so I felt like goddamn Linda Blair or someone, you know, <laughs> you know, just crazy. Just crazy. But here it was, the power. And I could turn my will and my life over to it. I had to learn what that was. My will was my thinking, my life was my actions. But it had to be all of it, not just the now, it had to be everything I had done, am doing, and will do. It had to be everything I wish I'd done, would like to be doing, and, and would like and will do. See? 
My thinking was the mind, my action was the body. My mental and physical. Now, my actions were different to my thinking. Every, see, how many people can't live in the now because they're carrying around all this guilt, shame and remorse from yesterday? How many people can't live in the now because they've got all this fear, worry and anxiety about tomorrow? But we've got to live in the now. N-O-W is no other way. But I can't live in the now because I've got all this stuff going on. But when I turn my will and my life over to care of God, now I can do that. I've got to do it by four through nine, but I make a decision to do it in three. My will and my life. My life is everything I have done, am doing and will do. Past, present, future. My thinking, my will is everything I wish I'd done, would like to be doing and hope I'll do. And they're different. For example, what I did was different to what I wish I'd done. What I wish I'd done was graduate college, go on to become a lawyer. What I actually did was go out, run with the fast crowd, take drugs and end up in the penitentiary. Married to Bubba. <laughs> Bubba's waiting. See? So I could do all that first three steps. See? Didn't know nothing about that. I was still, but while I was doing all this other mind-altering chemicals, it was blocking the channel to the higher power. And that power greater than myself that I had to rely on to recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, I was blocking it and giving it the finger. Didn't know I was giving it the finger, but was giving it the finger. Denial. D-E-N-I-A-L. Don't even notice I am lying. <laughs> See, I'm giving God the finger. Why? Because God gave me this brain. Page 86 tells me that. Gave me a brain to use. He gave you a brain to use. Gave me a great mind. I got a great mind. Are you? So have you. You got the mind he wants you to have. I got a great mind, got a great education, got goddamn letters after my name, got a PhD, pretty heavy drinker. Uh, <laughs> now, if I got to, if I got to, like, turn to a power greater than myself to restore me to sanity, how can I keep giving it a finger? It's gave me a mind that it wants me to have and use. And I'm saying, thanks for the program, thanks for the fellowship, thanks for the beautiful 12 steps, but as far as you're concerned in my mind, go screw off. Because with my mind, I'm going to take this mind-altering substance to alter that mind you gave me because I want to do something different or think I can change it. What's that other than giving God the finger? Can't, can't recover from this. Can't, like, block the channels to the higher power. No human power could do it, so I've got to turn to the higher power. Can't keep giving God the finger by taking a mind-altering chemical. See, it don't work. Now, I'm not a medical man. If you've got a condition that you need to take a medication for, this ain't my business. I'm just a straight meat and potatoes guy from an old garden variety drunk, man. It ain't my business to tell you what you're doing medically, and, and, and that ain't what I'm up here for. But we know what we're doing. We know when we're, like, pulling some shit. See? And I can't afford to do that, so I had to leave all that shit out. I was a real alcoholic, a real alcoholic, and I've learned you've got to stand for something or you fall for everything. And I'm a real alcoholic, as described in this book. And you guys told me, Mick, you've got to leave out all that shit. You've got to stop doing all that shit. I said, what do you mean, stop? I said, we've got a disease, a disease called alcoholism. We've got to stop doing it. We're sicker than other people. S-T-O-P, sicker than other people. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, how do I do that? We get granted a gift, a gift of sobriety. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. G-I-F-T. God is forever there. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, what's he there for? He's there to help. H-E-L-P. His ever-loving presence. The book says, remember we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling and powerful. Without help, it's too much for us. Too much for us. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, where'd you get this gift? G-I-F-T-S. Get it from the steps. That's where you get it. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Oh. Well, I don't know about that shit. I'm an earth man. I can't be so bloody heavenly that I'm no earthly good. No, that's why we got a program. Program? What do you mean program? P-R-O-G-R-A-M. People relying on God, relaying a message. That's what the program is. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, how do I find out about this program? You've got to ask. You've got to want it. 
Ask, what do you mean, ask? A-S-K. Ask saving kit. That's what your ask saving kit is. Got to ask. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, who shall I ask? Try a sponsor. Sponsor? What do you mean, sponsor? S-P-O-N-S-O-R. Sober person offering newcomers suggestions on recovery. That's what a sponsor is. <laughs> <laughs> what shall I ask him? What's in the book? Book? What book? <laughs> this book, the big book. What do you mean, big book? B I G B double O K. Believing in God beats our old knowledge. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, what's in the book? The steps. Steps? What do you mean, steps? S T E P S. Solution to every problem sober. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> have I got to work the steps? Of course you've got to work the steps. And why have I got to work the steps, for heaven's sake? Because if you want to quit drinking and using and don't replace it with the steps, you go crazy, you go nuts. Nuts, what do you mean nuts? N-U-T-S, not using the steps. That's what nuts is. <laughs> Does everybody work the steps? No, not everybody works the steps. Oh, well, why are you picking on me then? Why have I got to work them? If everybody don't got to work them, why have I got to work them? Oh, you don't have to work the steps if you don't want to. Well, why happens if I don't want to work the steps? Oh, you can go up to Monterey and see them folk up there that are not working the steps. <laughs> How will I know they are? I'll go to their conference. You'll see them walking around full of fear. Fear? What do you mean, fear? F-E-A-R. Frantic efforts to appear recovered. You'll see them. Don't worry. <laughs> Won't see any in here, will we? No, I don't want to be full of fear. I'll work the steps then. If you work the steps, of course I'll work the steps. Well, why don't you work the steps? So I'll stay sober. Sober? What do you mean, sober? S O B E R. Son of a bitch. Everything's real. That's what sober is. <coughs> well, what do you want to be sober for anyway, for Christ's sake? What do I want to be sober for? I'll tell you why I want to be sober. I want to be sober because I came here a hopeless dope fiend. Now I'm a dopeless hope fiend. That's why I want to be sober. Hope? What do you mean hope? H-O-P-E. Happy our program exists. Who's happy they got a program here? No shit. Maybe H-O-P-E is hearing other people's experiences. That's all we're doing here, isn't it? We come here and share our experience, strength and hope with each other. Beautiful book, don't say opinion, strength and hope. <laughs> Bloody lip flappers say that shit. Everything you hear from me, strictly your own opinion. I feel like saying, shove it up your ass. <laughs> share our experience, strength and hope with each other to recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And that's what we're doing here. And that's what works and that's what has worked and that's what will work. And those folk out there, they don't know. That's why we've got to invite them in here. Come together. One alcoholic relating to another alcoholic. That's what works. See, and that's all there is, really. There ain't no more than that, really. That's what this book's all about. Look, look, Alcoholics Anonymous. Look, A-L-C-O-H-O-L-I-C-S. Alcoholics, A-N-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S. Now, remember our three legacies. You know what the three legacies are on our triangle? Recovery, unity, service. That's why AAs are us. Alcoholics Anonymous, Recovery, Unity, Service. Get it? Perhaps you've got to be a limey for that one, don't we? <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, this is what it means. Look. A life centred on helping others lives in complete sobriety. Actions, not our names, yield maintenance of unity and service. And that's what we do around here. And that's all there is. See? That's the truth. Now, I'll tell you why that's important. Because them folk out there, they don't know about our 12-step recovery program that we help each other. they got to save their life on a daily basis, but they ain't got a 12-step program like we have. That's why I like to tell a couple of little stories at the end of these talks. One little story I like to tell is of the two dudes driving across the desert in their Jeep. Baking hot day, Jeep breaks down, they're screwed. Holy shit, what are we going to do? I don't know, what are you doing? I don't know either. Just then they see a mountain lion sneak round a rock looking real mean and hungry. Said, oh crikey, what are we going to do? Said, I don't know, what are you doing? Said, I'm putting on my running shoes, man. 
If you put on your running shoes, what the hell good's that? Everybody knows you can't outrun a mountain lion. He said, I ain't got to outrun the lion, I've just got to outrun you. <laughs> Selfish bastards, see? They don't know nothing about sticking together and helping each other, see? <laughs> now, if you want to know what the solution to the problem is, it really helps to know what the real problem is. Not just what my delusionary thinking thinks it is, but what it really is, and that's in this book. See? I know how you feel. <laughs> that's why I like telling the White Rabbit story. Great little story. Not my story. Got it from Clint, but I'll tell it better on him. <laughs> Two neighbours fussing and fighting, and they're always fussing and fighting, and they get this kind of truce going, and... Uh, and one day the little terrier dog of one of the neighbours comes in and it's got the next door neighbour's white rabbit in its mouth and it's all dead and bloody and, and, and the neighbour says, oh shit, just as we're getting like settled and holy, what am I going to do now? This is going to set it all off again. Oh, delusionary thinking kicks in. I know what I'll do, solution to the problem. He snatches the rabbit off the dog, washes it all clean, gets a hairdryer and blows it all fluffy dry. Sneaks in next door's yard, opens up the cage, throws the rabbit in the cage, snaps it close and screws off back on. Whew. Well, come the weekend, he sees his neighbour working in the yard, he thinks, I'll go out and have a word. So he does. He goes out, sees his neighbour, he says, uh, uh, hi neighbour. His neighbour said, hi. Well, you know the dude's got to be one of us, because he can't leave well enough alone. He said, uh, how's the rabbit? Dude said, funny thing happened with the old rabbit. He said, it died here last week and I buried it up the end of the garden. But I see it's made its way back to its cage now. <laughs> <laughs> see, so if, if you want to know what the solution to the problem is, it really helps to know what the real problem is. And we find that out from ourselves in here. I never knew I was an alcoholic till I came here. Was an alcoholic till I came here, for Christ's sake. See? How do we do that, man? How do we come here and we recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body? Start doing these simple things. Start working this program. Start helping each other. How do we do that, man? I mean, it's just a miracle. I think that's why we call it a miracle, because it's goddamn amazing, man. It's amazing for alcoholics and addicts to stay clean and sober. It's amazing. How do we do that? How do we work a program? How do we get, get on with this thing? Great. It amazes me sometimes. I had a, like I'm going home to see my mum and uh, I'm going to the 50th anniversary in Ireland. The 50th anniversary of Alcoholics Anonymous is in Ireland in April. I'm going to go over there and, and uh, see my mum and She's a happy, contented old lady and she's 80 years of age. And, and, and How do we do some of this stuff, man? How do we make some of those amends? How do we pay? My sponsor, he changes my thinking. I'm an old bank robber. My sponsor's a judge. I don't go for someone who's got what I want. I went for somebody opposite to what I was. Teaches me different things to what I am. Well, I was doing my amends, for example, he said, I said to him, God, I can't stand it, everybody's after my dough. Everybody wants my money, for Christ's sake. I can't got no dough, everybody's after my money. He said, nobody's after your money. Yes, they are, everybody wants something. Nobody wants none of your money, they want their money back. <laughs> I don't think that way. That thought had never occurred to me. How do you make an amend to an old lady, a mum like you got mums and I got mums? How do I make an amend to a lady who's, who's just old and in the twilight of her years for all those years of suffering that you put her through? I'm going over there to see her. You know what? I'll tell you something that happened. and I, I share this story and sometimes it, it gets to me, but... I've been many places in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and had many privileges. I... I've done many young people's conventions. I was in Australia January, February and March of this year at the Vicky Par, the first ever young people's com conference in Australia. Victoria Young People's. And now they've got Aussie Par, which is going to be the Australian. You know, and we started that off. And it's, it's been going... 
A magnificent event. I've been to the White House twice. I've been to the Capitol building. I've been around. I've done a lot of things, man, as a result of being clean and sober. How does that happen? So That old lady, you know, my mum. On her, on her piano in her house, she's got a flag, the American flag, the Stars and Stripes flag, and it's folded in a triangular shape like that, and it's in a glass-fronted cabinet. And she got that from Washington, D.C. When I was at Washington, D.C., you know, they did a whole load of things, but at one stage they took me up to the, to the dome, the top of the dome, and they... They flew the American flag off the top of the dome and then they took it down and folded it special and they put it in that glass fronted cabinet and they put a brass plaque on the front of that glass, pla that glass fronted cabinet and on that brass plaque it said this flag flew over America to celebrate Mickey Bush's birthday and then they sent that to my mum in, in, in England and she's got that on her piano. She's immensely proud of that. And all her girlfriends come round and, you know, they're just a bunch of old ladies and, you know, they do whatever old ladies do, talk, sit around, talk shit, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 they, and they say, tell us some more stories about your Mickey in America, Mary. Where is he this month? What's he doing? And I'll send her a tape from Joan, whatever, what's your name over there? Oh, uh, the one laughing. Because I, I call her and I send her and I stay in touch to try and be a better son than I've ever been. And I'll tell her that I was in Monterey and I was at the Young Folks Convention and, and, and I'll send her a tape and she'll hear your laughter and she'll, she'll enjoy that. In fact, uh, you want to say hello to my mum for the tape? Yeah. Well, let's say hello to mum, right? On the count of three, right? On the count of three, we'll say, Hi mum, how's that? Is that what you say here? They spell it M-O-M, Mum. They don't spell it M-U-M. <laughs> All right, one, two, three. Hi, Hi Mum! <laughs> She'll like that. <laughs> She'll like that. She'll say, oh, you silly bugger. No. <laughs> but, you know, her friends say to her, like, tell us some more stories, Mary. You know, and her chest goes out and she's proud, you know. And she does. She tells them a few stories, tells them a few lies too, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, her friend, <clears throat> they never used to say, you know, tell us some more stories of Mickey in America, Mary. They used to say to her, are they going to let your Mickey out of the nut ward for Christmas this year, Mary? And she would cringe in shame and, you know, because she hurt, you know, she loved me and, 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 you know, and I didn't know none of that. That's really weird as well. I sat in the speaker's chair on the floor of the House of Representatives, you know. I sat in that chair, <laughs> looked out over the floor and there was congressmen all around and shit. And I looked out and I just picked up on the funny side of it. It was weird. I mean, I, I come out of a nut ward for the criminally insane. What the hell am I doing sitting in the speaker's chair, the floor of the House of Representatives? <laughs> I went into a laughing fit, man. I just, <laughs> I just cracked up laughing. <laughs> slipped off the goddamn chair. It's a bloody big chair, you know. And slipped on the floor. Congressman said, what are you doing? Oh, I said, you'll never understand what he said. I said, I'm mental, I am. Did how does somebody who's crazy get to sit in the speaker's chair on the floor of the House of Representatives? Looked at me weird. He said it happens every day. <laughs> <laughs> See, but we get to do that, don't we? And I'll give you a clue, folk. Look, we've got to wrap this up. I've even gone over like I always do. I get excited talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, you said, keep coming back, we love you, and you gave me phone numbers. My phone number, incidentally, is 818 area code 760-1346. And give me a call. I love hearing from you guys, and I love getting your numbers too. Give me your numbers afterwards, you know, and call me up. But you gave me a phone number. When I, when I got home, I was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous from day one. I didn't know it, but I was. Because when I got home, I called that number, and a dude answered the phone. 
And I said, I don't know who you are, but I got your note. He said, I remember you from the meeting today. I said, oh, is that right? He said, yeah. I said, holy shit. He said, you want to go to another one of them meetings? I said, yeah, I do. I want to go. Is there one tonight? He said, yeah, there's loads of them. There's loads of meetings in Los Angeles. Go every night. I said, you go. How long have you been doing it? He said, I'm four months sober. I said, you go to meetings at night? He said, every night. I said, can I go to a meeting with you tonight? He went, well, tonight I, I normally would, but I'm going to go to a movie tonight. I said, oh, all right. Don't matter then. Don't matter. Don't matter. Because now I felt all little. You know what it means to feel little? And he picked up on it. He went, wait a minute. He went, holy shit, I'm sorry, pal. He said, what the hell's wrong with me? He said, four months sober and a newcomer wants to go to a meeting and I tell him, no, I'm going to a movie? Holy shit, I'm sorry. He said, where do you live? I'm going to come around and pick you up and take you to a meeting. I said, really? He said, yeah, really. I said, oh, wow. All right. And he did. He came round. He came round. I made the call and he came round. And he was weird too. He was. He was weird. Real weird. He came round in a little red Fiat. Little red Fiat. But it had all Mercedes emblems on it and shit. You know what I mean? It was all... It was. Weird mother he was, yeah. But you know what? Guess what? He's still four months ahead of me. It works, you see. Action. In our personal relationships, we have to apply these principles in all our affairs. Now, I ain't good at that. I need your help with that. I ain't good at relationships. I try hard, but I ain't good at it. My personal relationships are the cause of nearly all my woes, including my alcoholism. Now, you've got a bunch of people here that are probably in the same bag. I wrote a word for relationships. You want to hear it? Relationship. Oh, see if you relate. R-E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S-H-I-P. Really exciting love affair turns into outrageous nightmare. Sobriety hangs in peril. Can you <laughs> Well, obviously you relate. Now, if you think you can work that shit out on your own, I'm like, you're different than me. I need you guys, you see. And if you're wondering whether you is or whether you isn't a real alcoholic or not, here's a little clue. You better not have laughed in here tonight. See, because if you've laughed in here, you may have caught this disease. Because you catch it in these rooms, I'm telling you. It comes in through the ears, man. And here's the clue. If you're laughing, they say if you're laughing, you're relating. And if you're relating to a sick bugger like me, there ain't no doubt about you, pal. Because I don't get through to no well people. Well people don't laugh at my shit. You people, alcoholic people, laugh with me. And for that, I thank you. And I... I, I wrap this up in exactly the same way as you guys gave it to me on that very first day. You told me, we love you, keep coming back, and I do you. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.